Ja, schönen guten Abend. Ich freue mich sehr, dass das Kino voll ist zu diesem doch sehr besonderen Programm, sehr besonderen Film. Und ähm, ich freue mich ja ganz besonders, dass Bill Morrison heute Abend hier ist und seinen Film Dawson City Frozen Times hier vorstellt. Ähm, ich möchte mich auch nur ganz kurz sozusagen bei unseren Kooperationspartnern bedanken. Das ist das Institut für Eng England- und Amerika-Studien. Und ähm, der Professor für Amerikanistik Bernd Herzogenrath ist heute Abend hier und wird sozusagen durch den Abend führen und auch Sonja Campanini, Juniorprofessorin für Filmkultur. Sie wird am Institut für Theater, Film und Medienwissenschaften. Sie ist auch hier und wird nachher auch beim Gespräch mit dabei sein. Noch ganz kurz zum Ablauf. Es wird erst so eine ganz kurze, zehnminütige, fünfstündige Einführung von, von Bernd geben. Dann läuft der Film und im Anschluss gibt es eben das Gespräch und wo es dann auch die Möglichkeit gibt, Publikumsfragen zu stellen. Dann gebe ich jetzt das Wort weiter an Bernd. Ja. Yeah. Hi everybody, from here on in English, right? So that was uh, the kind of prerequisite that uh, we're doing this evening in English because our guest is uh, American and German is not his second language, so it might be easier. So what I'm going to do is, first of all, just introduce Bill to you, then give uh, a couple of thanks to people involved, and then have a short introduction onto the nexus of time and film before we then actually walk Dawson City. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Bill Morrison, not only a renowned and well-known filmmaker, but also my favorite filmmaker, if that is any worth. But uh, I'm a big fan, you know that. So I was really happy that Bill uh, accepted my invitation for the second time, so he, he was here seven years ago as well. Uh, Bill is a, a New York-based filmmaker and, and visual artist, and one of the things that his films are known for is not only the use of archival footage, but also the combination of that archival footage with uh, uh, a particular made sound for that film. So he has, he has been working with uh, lots of influential composers, including uh, John Adams, Philip Glass, Michael Gordon, uh, Johann Johansson, uh, to name just a few. And this combination always makes it makes it very special. Uh, maybe one of the most uh, well-known films of Bill's is uh, Decasia, which people from uh, my seminar also have the pleasure and pain to, to work with, because sometimes for people not coming from film studies, this is a kind of, uh, let's say, new territory. Uh, the more I'm uh, really excited to have Bill here, and B Bill, maybe you, you say a few words before we start with that short yeah. talk, and then just say hi. <laughs> Take the mic. Maybe. First of all, thank you, Bernd, uh, for having me back and um, for all the support these uh, over the years. And uh, thank you, Natasha, for having us here at uh, the Deutsche Museum. This is wonderful. Um, and thank you all for coming out. This is such so thrilling to see all the seats filled, and um, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, this is, um, in some ways, my most accessible film. It, um, is uh, was many years in the making and um, I first heard of this story when I was a student in art school and always had it in the back of my mind that I would one day make this film and uh, I just really had to wait for the technology to catch up <laughs> in a certain way um, but um, what we'll talk about the, the film is uh, highly expositional and um, there's a lot of text and um, many different stories so um, I won't talk too much about the film now. I just wanted to say hi, and of course, we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Thank you. Okay, great. So, so first, I need to uh, 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 throw all my thank yous at you. Yeah? So there's a big thank you to Natasha and the Deutsche Film Museum for hosting us. Of course, the sponsors have also to be mentioned. There's the Kulturamt of the city of Frankfurt, uh, the Freunde und Förder der Goethe Universität, but the biggest chunk of thanks goes out to a former student and friend, not former friend, but actual friend, I hope, uh, who basically made, made all this possible, which is Josef Akebrand. Hello, Josef. Thank you for all that. Just give a big hand for Josef as well. Uh, and of course, for, for Bill, for having accepted uh, that invitation. So let me just for, I don't know, 10 14 minutes just introduce you to the uh, nexus of, of time and film and the uh, idea of archival films and frozen times. Um, so from the very beginning, uh, film had, uh, has had a complex relationship to time. 
Yeah, so this is just one, one instance. Uh, in its very beginning, with the idea of uh, chronophotography, uh, for example, uh, in, invented by people like Etienne Jules Marais and Edward Mybridge. So in this chron uh, chronophotography, which, in which Marais basically posed that motion is only the relation of time to space, you can already see how time and motion figure predominantly, right? So most of you know these images where people try, or where Marais tried to capture motion in these uh, still shots, which then got more and more abstract. The other relation of time to space is, for example, in film's promise to capture uh, life or to capture memory, right? So after the first screenings, you had uh, newspaper uh, uh, coverage like this, where La Poste in 1895, after the first Lumiere screening, uh, posed this a phrase that when apparatuses like this are available to the public, when everyone can photograph those that are dear to them, not only their post forms, but their movements, their actions, their familiar gestures, with words at the tips of their tongues, death will cease to be absolute. Right? So this idea that a life or a memory can be materialized in film. Um, this is also a, a kind of idea that informs one of the most important early film critics, uh, André Bazin, who in his text Ontology of the Photographic Image, but which implicitly and explicitly deals with film, um, coined the phrase of the so-called mummy complex, you know, with the idea that film is the modern day equivalent to uh, the mummy, the, the conservation of, of dead bodies. Yeah? Um, for Bazin, for example, this uh, relic, the Holy Shroud of Turin, was basically a first instance of film, because here you have almost like a, a foot, what one might call a footprint of the real, yeah? an image that by direct touch is being placed on, in this case, a shroud, or let's call it the, the mummy's bandages. Yeah? And in his text, Bazin calls this image a synthesis of relic and photograph. And here you can see Bazin was a, a, a devout Catholic, right? So in a way, his Catholicism plays into his, his film theory. Yeah? So he said that film embalms time, rescuing it simply from its proper corruption. Yeah? So time doesn't move on, doesn't, doesn't fade away, but is captured in the idea of film. The thing now is that, and Bazin knew that as a, as a lover of also popular film, that uh, most of the times uh, the mummy lives. <laughs> so the question is what happens with the bandages? Yeah? So what if the corruption and entropy or decay proper to time also eat away at the mummy's bandages? What if these die and decay, which also means uh, what if these have a proper life of their own? So film as having a proper life of its own uh, in addition to what it depicts or what it represents, what it shows. Yeah, so for early film, for early nitrate film, uh, we can pose this phrase, this film is dangerous. And dangerous not like today, that it might contain graphic violence or language unfit for kids, but film, <laughs> film in its materiality was, was highly explosive. For, for all of us who have seen uh, Cinema Paradiso or Inglorious Bastards know what this is about, right? So whole cinema could go up in flames. Why was that so? Because the chemical formula of nitrocellulose, which included camper, for example, as a uh, natural material, uh, had lots of oxygen in its chemical formula, which means it, it didn't need oxygen to come from its outside to fend the flames. It already had enough of that itself. Which is why, and this is a kind of okay, short film, about 35 feet where somebody's trying to burn a whole reel of fire. nitrate film by putting it into a bucket full of so we'll water, to the just of this, see what happens. Uh, bucket of water. And it's fully involved here, we're going to slip it in. And as you can see, as you can see, uh, from the bubbling, <laughs> from the bubbling it keeps burn on burning, right? So you can't like just uh, extinguish it. It's, it's highly inflammable. Then why use it? Uh, because nitrocellulose, uh, in a way gave you the, the most shiny uh, grades of silver. So it was the, basically the, the most aesthetically, aesthetically pleasing material that uh, filmmakers had at their disposal before the invention of uh, uh, celluloid, of, of plastic film, or safety film. 
Yeah? And this is what happens if you don't store that film properly. Yeah? And since Bill is mostly working with found footage or archive material, for example, in sta states of its, of its decay or natural death cycle, let's put it like that, what happens is that film develops these beautiful images that were not meant to be, at least not meant to be by the original filmmaker. Yeah? So that's basically what uh, humidity, uh, temperature, and all these natural factors do to film. Yeah? So uh, the image uh, depolymerizes, uh, basically bubbles are created which distort the image, yeah? all these kind of uh, water damages and, and humidity damages which appear on the film uh, uh, image itself until it turns into a kind of dry uh, so-called hockey puck which uh, you, you cannot screen anymore. Yeah? It's just a dry powder. And with these uh, images before that state, of course, that's the kind of material with which uh, Bill works. Yeah? For example, that's a short example from the Kaja, yeah? where you have that boxer maybe in the original uh, sparring with a punching ball and here it's almost as if a, a, a kind of dangerous blob is engulfing its, its existence. Right? So there's an image uh, developed which, uh, as I said, was not meant to be by the original fame filmmaker. So I don't want, don't want to talk too long, so I don't show you the other images because we have a whole film coming. I just wanted to return to Bazin, who in his text on the ontology of the photographic image says that photography and film affects us like a phenomenon in nature, like a flower or a snowflake whose vegetable or earthly origins are an inseparable part of their beauty. Right? And if we know that this early film material was, has basically a kind of vegetable origin, because it's camper after all, uh, we can say, yes, Bazin, you're right. Yeah? And uh, Bill's film basically show that, also that, that beauty that uh, comes out of that. So I want to finish with uh, two or three quotations by, by Bill on his films that, uh, in a way, I think were basically related to Decasia, but basically shed a light on I would argue, quite a lot of his work, where he said that the frame pauses briefly before the projector's lamp and then moves on. Our lives are accumulations of ephemeral images and moments that our consciousness constructs into a reality. No sooner have we grasped the present, it is relegated to the past, where it only exists in the subjective history of each individual. So in a way, it's a kind of different film history going by when you watch Bill's films. Um, the images can be thought of as desires or memories, actions that play, take place in the mind. The film stock can be thought of as their body, that which enables these events to be seen. Like our own bodies, this celluloid is a fragile and ephemeral medium that can deteriorate in countless ways. And since uh, we have this uh, event also in uh, cooperation with, uh, as we already mentioned, with the MA Filmkultur, uh, where, of course, also the question of uh, conservation is, is prime. Um, there was another quotation which is gone, <laughs> where basically, uh, and maybe this is something that we can talk about later, where basically says, Bill says that in a way his work is aligned with the conservationists' ideas, but in a way it's not. So it's not simply about rescuing the film and returning it to a pristine state, but something else is at stake here. Yeah? So, since we already had <laughs> the introduction to Bill, this is Bill, by the way, but the real Bill is sitting somewhere up there. So, let me just uh, finish by saying that uh, Dawson City, Frozen Time is the, the film that we're going to watch now. And just, just one last idea which I had when this uh, idea of uh, archival film and Frozen Time was mentioned. So, in a way, what we have hopefully seen in that short introduction is that uh, film tries to capture and freeze fleeting moments. In Dawson City, we can see that this freezing process at work very literally, right? So, the films, after all, were frozen. But after the freezing, of course, came the thawing, which again very literally resulted in water damage, the result of which is witnessed by each and every frame you are about to see. And it seems as if this water damage always has a, a kind of similar structure, and, and Bill surely can or will say more about this later in the Q&A. So it's, it's a definite uh, thing that you're going to see that water damage does, almost like a kind of idiosyncratic handwriting or the signature style of a famous filmmaker, only that in that respect the famous filmmaker is nature and uh, 
the interaction between film and nature itself. So, I hope you enjoy Dawson City. Out go the lights. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for this. So I don't know. I'm, I'm always getting emotional about that because I think the not not simply because I love you, <laughs> but I think the the, the love for and uh, care and respect for film that oozes out of that totally gets me every time. So thanks for that. I hope people uh, have a kind of similar feeling. So take a seat. Uh, why don't you come on, the middle guy, the middle man. <laughs> Okay, so now we have time for, uh, I don't know, commentaries, uh, questions, basically uh, everything that is related to the film, right? So I'd, we all have a microphone here, and I think there's a microphone going around there as well, or should we take one of those? Okay, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, I don't know, so how, how, how should we do that? Uh, <laughs> is there any questions first here, or does anybody already have a question and we just... I think we can just shoot and then, yeah. Uh, maybe just an easy question to get it started. Uh, how long did it take you to, from the conception of the idea that you were going to make this to starting it to actually fulfilling to having this movie that you have now? How long did the process take? So, um, as I, I believe I mentioned in um, my opening remarks, there it was sort of a a story that I knew about for some years, and um, uh, it was anecdotal, um, perhaps apocryphal. Uh, it, um, people got the facts wrong, um, but the, uh, there was this story that would sort of pass around amongst people who were interested in old film, um, the legend of the Dawson City find. And um, uh, as I started to see uh, you know, just that there was a swimming pool in the Arctic, which was already strange enough, and that uh, there was films that were found in the swimming pool 50 years later. Um, and I couldn't imagine whose swimming pool it was. I just heard this story. Um, I had always imagined that the story had perpetuated itself um, and that people still talked about it. Um, but when I got serious about making the film, which was probably in um, 2013, um, so three years is a quick answer. Um, I, I uh, um, uh, started researching and I realized that Sam Kula had written an article that was published in two different publications. And there wasn't that much else about the Dawson City find and that people of my age and older, of course, remembered it. Um, but people younger than me had no, had never heard of it before. Um, over the years at different conferences, I'd seen sam examples of it, and um, it's fairly distinguishable, as I try to point out at the, towards the end of the film, that it, ha it has a certain type of water damage that most nitrate films don't show. You know, if they're damaged, it's um, internal to the, the nitrate decay. And in this case, because they were so cold, um, there wasn't a lot of nitrate decay. The part of the image that was preserved is preserved really intact. And what you have is this kind of white flutter um, on the edges, um, which archivists um, loathsomely call the Dawson flutter. You know, uh, um, mostly because uh, no one's convinced that with all, with all cases that that flutter um, was uh, or organic to it being buried in the ground. I imagine there were some, obviously some were very close to the surface, the ones, for instance, that the kids lit on fire, you know. But uh, generally, uh, you know, those in the summer of 1978, um, those films were, you know, taken out of a swimming pool and re removed to this uh, ice house and, um, and then examined by amateurs um, all summer long. And when they finally did make their way to um, Ottawa, where they were examined by experts, um, archivists, and preservationists, uh, that was a good, um, I don't know, five months later. And um, we'll, we'll look at the uh, short um, tomorrow during the, uh, the master class. But uh, Bill Farrell, who's sitting next to Sam Kula on the left, he doesn't say anything, but he's... Um, uh, the head of preservation, 
he says that you could run a your finger across the film and the emulsion would come off and so um uh, it was incredibly um unstable and they developed a process whereby they could could stabilize it so um uh, the uh, the film itself probably suffered from being excavated um, at that time um, nonetheless it remained um, in vaults uh, preserved for almost as long as it remained underground um, before I got to it so um, in I guess in sometime in 2012 um, um, an ar a curator named Paul Gordon who um, works at Library and Archives Canada still he's head of digital migration um, he also runs a independent film series in Ottawa, and he invited me to come up and show Decasia and um, mentioned that, uh, you know, I was welcome to come to his the place where he worked also and play in his sandbox there. And uh, I, I asked him straight out, you have the Dawson City collection? And he was like, yeah, we do, and you're welcome to look at it. So that um, involved, uh, you know, he showed me a list of films. I named a dozen that I'd like to look at um, a day in advance and he was able to bring them out of storage and bring them up to temperature and then I wound through them or in most cases I was able they were reference copies and I was able to put them on a flatbed and view them and um, and it occurred to me that not a lot of people had seen these films like for, pretty early on I saw that uh, baseball footage which is I know that means very little to a European audience but to an American that's like uh, finding it's finding uh, some kind of lost uh, sports scripture yeah um, that's a very famous series it's uh, in it's re referenced in in the great Gatsby um, it's, it's it's a part of American folklore so the fact that I when I saw that early on I say I don't think people have looked at this collection very deeply and so then I uh, was pretty convinced that I was going to make this film so that would have been in the spring of 2013 and um, uh, it was probably another year before I got any money from Arte to do that and then um, uh, I guess there was another year of uh, research and figuring out where everything was buried and and then a real full year of um, of editing and, and when I say a year of editing that would be like three weeks of just going at it hard and then coming back out and you know, trying to get some sleep and you know do other jobs you know and then like a uh, going in for another three weeks like that and, you know, um, these surges I guess you know. maybe um, relating to that how do you approach the archival material uh, how do you like s start um, looking uh, look at it in, at it so which is your process approaching the material do you start with uh, looking the catalog or uh, what's your process well I mean one thing that attracted me to this project is that I knew that all this footage had been earmarked by its time either in the ground or coming out of the ground and uh, therefore it it referenced its own materiality, which interested me, um, that it was um, ephemeral images that had been grounded, literally, um, earthbound, and uh, and then um, were now ephemeral again. Um, and so that um, that's a topic that I've kind of wrestled with in different ways throughout my entire body of work and um, so I knew that Dawson City was going to give me that it was you know, I was going to see the the carnal imprint of the film um, as well as its spirit and um, I also realized that it was a big enough collection that I would probably if once I learned what the story was exactly and there was nothing authoritative about what the, f the story was um, that I would be able to tell it using those images and whatever else I could find that supported it um, so once I had the uh, access to the collection, there was a sortable Word doc, and I could go through and find um, terms that I thought would help me tell the story, um, mining or cinema or gold or whatever, you know, um, the North, and try to find references to that, um, either in the titles or the, in the inner titles or the synopsis, if there was one. 
Um, and, um, and then, you know, working with Paul and uh, archivists um, at the, the Yukon Film Archive or the Dawson City Museum or uh, University of Washington had all their Eric Haig photos. Um, and, uh, of course, Library Archives Canada and the Library of Congress, um, just trying to see what references to Dawson there were, um, you know, because none of the films themselves referred to Dawson City. Um, none of the films that were buried referred to Dawson City. Those were all external supporting films. Or, so, um, but they all sort of had this equal weight. You know, they were all clips that, um, that represented this passage from um, a time before motion pictures happened to a time um, to the present, basically. So I thought about each decade having its own format, um, starting with the present, and that was this, uh, you know, very saturated digital image of me at a in a sports show with this interviewer as sort of a meta reference to the making of the film itself. Because soon after I discovered that baseball footage, um, the baseball world went crazy, and you know they wanted me on their show and to talk about my baseball film. <laughs> And um, and then um, we go back to just after the films were restored, and um, that's also CBC news footage um, sh shot on film and um, on 16 millimeter, and um, and then um, further back the photographs that Kathy Gates, thank God, had the presence of mind to take as the films were being exhumed and. Uh, again, um, contemporary footage that I shot of Michael and Kathy in interview, and um, you know he he talks about how the the test of doing the nitrate to find out whether it was old or new, and um, well that was some 1960s 16 millimeter footage, and then you drop down into the I think of it as an archaeological dig. You go back to the beginning, um, the the formation of celluloid. Um, of, of a nitrate stock out of uh, gun cotton and um, you know and that becomes the the base or the the tablets on which our entire motion picture history was constructed the faulty tablets you know the the explosive tablets and um, and um, then you have the uh, the Lumieres and um, um, that beautifully restored footage from incredibly from 1895 um, at the Lumiere Institute and uh, I believe Chinateca Bologna restored um, of the photographers leaving the boat which was um, the first film that was ever shown to an audience of more, th more than just a single person looking through a people to multiple people in cinema um, forming a society and uh, and then all the paper print collection um, all the Edison shots of of the gold rush and uh, and those were again films that um, were ephemeral and um, through a legal loophole were printed on paper uh, and registered as photographs because there was no they predated any motion picture copyright law and so you had these paper rolls with all these successive images on them, um, which survived um, the actual films themselves as fossils. And so we have this incredibly complete record of um, films from 1896 to 1912 that were saved on paper and then reprinted decades later. And then uh, the decade of the teens and 20s is represented by the Dawson City Collection itself, nitrate. Uh, original that was um, incredibly stored in frozen ground for um, 50 years and um, a cool archival vault for another 38. And um, and then working our way out of that, uh, the uh, amateur footage that was shot um, of the, um, you know, the, the parades and the fire and the travel logs that were shot by amateurs and locals and the incredible 35 millimeter mid-century film City of Gold um, by Colin Lowe and um, and then on into uh, more 16 millimeter newsreels and finally circling back to um, the 70s 
uh, and Kathy Gates' photographs and um, the sort of bad video that came in the wake of that. And the, the, every decade has its own flavor, I guess. Yeah. So um, I, I thought of how to tell the story chronologically, but also using the different formats to, um, uh, to demarcate epics, you know, of uh, uh, maybe stratified time. Uh, um, as as we saved these images and how they were represented, and um, so I, I, you know, constructed the film as a a decalogue, you know, of like what's going to represent the aughts, what's going to represent the tens and the teens and the forties and the fifties, and um, built it up layer by layer that way. Um, I have another uh, question of understanding, uh, also about the chronology. Chronology. Um, when have the nitrate films been put on safety film, and when have the safety films been uh, digitized, and what have you used? So, um, uh, the nitrate films when in 1978 uh, when they developed a. Um, a rewash technique, which was basically putting them in a, on um, through a film developing tank, but without any chemicals, just with distilled water, uh, cleaning them, and um, I think using some photo flow, and um, and therefore hardening them back up again so that they were stable. Uh, the the American titles were repatriated to the U.S., so that was a joint project between the Library of Congress and the American Film Institute, and. Uh, Library and Archives Canada had, I guess, maybe a third of, of the titles which had sh showed Canadian content in some way, and they were deemed Canadian. Um, and uh, uh, those got, um, you know, all printed. It was a massive printing job that happened over 1978, 1979, and probably 1980 as well, because uh, they, they got them in late 78, so I'd say 79 and 80. And um, then the U.S. and Canada shared copies of each of um, the acetate um, safety copies. And um, the, again, the originals showing U.S. content went to the Library of Congress, and the, the originals of Canadian content went to Library and Archives Canada, or national, it was um, as it's known now. Um, and uh, those, they made, you know, it's, Again, as the decades went, they made video copies. Um, there were um, uh, standard def copies. And um, um, I mostly used the uh, 35 millimeter prints as reference prints to begin with. And then, I guess, in the end of 2014, they had a 4K scanner, uh, a Scanity um, model shipped, and um, they got it online towards the end of that year. And um, at that point, I could just start shipping 12 terabyte drives to Ottawa and um, say, well, give me <coughs> all these titles, you know. And, um, and then um, eventually they would come back and I could use those um, masters as, as my cutting material, which um, I, that's why I say in some ways it was a project that needed the technology to catch up with it because I was able to see many more titles than most people had been able to see up until that point of that and um, see them quickly scan through you know what was relevant um, so um, I think we did most most everything at 2k um, and uh, you know at some point in the last year I started um, picking through I'm still refer to that master list a lot and um, when I'm looking for shots or looking for things that might reference something 100 years ago. And uh, I realized that I just didn't have all the newsreels, and the newsreels were what really interested me the most. So um, since then, I've made an exhaustive uh, request to get all the newsreels in at 4K. And, uh, well, that drive is supposed to be waiting for me when I get home. <laughs> Yeah, you're you're allowed. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, um, thank you very much. I was really impressed and also really moved, like you uh, uh, said, by the film. And uh, what impressed me the most was the like the, the intertwining between the the history of the gold rush, the history of the city, and, and uh, the uh, history of um, film history, history of movie going, and also material history of film. And uh, did you know before uh, when you started the project about all these connections, like Sid Grauman, uh, who was in Dawson and later become the cinema owner mogul of, of LA and uh, hosted the Oscars where the later film was shown. Yeah. So it just was so nice that you wrapped it up on several occasions in a film like that. And I mean, was it just... I didn't, I didn't, a, I didn't know about Pantages. I didn't know yeah, about yeah. Sid Grauman. I didn't know about William Desmond Taylor. Yeah. Oh. Um, Tex Rickard or... Um, uh, um, Fatty Arbuckle, or you know, it, it goes on and on. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so what I did know going in was that um, the the discovery, the film, the gold discovery happened in 1896, um, which is sort of the beginning of of large scale motion picture projection. You know, the big projectors and public display. You know, um, and I knew that that was enough synergy. Mm -hmm. to start the story, you know, mm -hmm, that, mm -hmm. if, if these two things happened. Um, and I also knew of the all the Edison footage of the gold rush um, uh, that was on the paper prints. And um, so I thought that that was a pretty good start, you know. And um, then I get, I went up to Dawson and met a, you know, a guy who works at the Dawson City Museum, and he started regaling me with all these stories of sort of pre-Hollywood. Um, and... The, what I was, came to realize is that Dawson sort of was its own movie set in a way. You know, it um, it what it you know was way after the California Gold Rush, maybe fifty years later, and um, after the Wild West years of the that kind of ended in the eighteen seventies or maybe eighteen eighty um, in the states. Uh, though a lot of those um, show people, people who um, had made their name about being Wild West cowboys um, or uh, badasses, you know, all made their way up there for one last hurrah that summer of uh, 1898 when all the 40,000 people were there. It was um, a town that had no history and was built in the image of a Western Wild West town, and it really bought into that story um, um, much more than it bought into having working plumbing or, you know... Um, a, you know, a viable town that could handle that number of people. Uh, it, it sounded pretty nasty, and I think the photographs, people don't look like they're having that much fun. Um, but uh, uh, from that, I think there also was this whole self-mediation um, of Dawson that, would, that, you know, that as people were going over the Chilkoot Pass, there was already a photographer there, and there was, uh, a, you know, somebody cranking... Uh, Edison newsreels uh, along the way, and um, and we see an Edison film probably shot in uh, Orange, New Jersey, of a poker game at Dawson City where they're cheating and uh, you know um, brawling, and um, and then there was this whole genre of of the Northern uh, that was uh, inspired many many titles, um, it's sort of a dead a dead genre now, I guess, but uh, maybe The Revenant uh, was our, our last Northern. But, it, you know, it, it had these staples. It had some um, Canadian Mountie, you know, in it, and there was some um, bad minor guy and, uh, you know, uh, uh, some gal who worked at the store or behind the bar who, you know, was always single. And, uh, you know, it, it had th these tropes of, you know, there was a lot of snow. And, um, uh, and so that always involved Dawson City or a town that sounded like Dawson City or rhymed with Dawson City. And, um, of course, um, the Hegg photographs eventually fell into the hands of Mary Pickford, and Mary Pickford turned Charlie Chaplin onto him, and so you can see how those f exact photographs shaped the same composition of the gold rush, you know. Um, and um, I think to this day uh, Dawson is still in love with that image that it, it had and I thought that librarian who who hipped me to all those um, uh, Hollywood references had 
had it right. He said, you know, it was a town with no history and no future, and uh, and and that bore out. Um, but I will say that the same type of personality that would make their way to Dawson City um, uh, to find the pot of gold at the other end of the Chilkoot Pass was the same type of personality that would form Hollywood. It would come to Hollywood and um, say, you know, there's a buck to be made here. You know, mine the miners, you know. Yeah, thank you. Sounds really like a dream of everybody working in the archival field, just digging up all those connections and uh, freaking out about it. So yeah. must have been a lot of fun doing that. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> In some ways, it was a really blessed project because of this um, Dawson City's awareness of itself. There was all these little planted gems everywhere, and um, you know, like for instance, the because of the hydraulic mining, they were continually uncovering the tusks of mastodons. You know, and so the um, that comes into the story many times, right? It's it's uh, at the beginning when they're just starting to get into big mining, but um, also at the end where um, you know, you see that the jeweler who um, Dawson Arts and Crafts, where uh, they eventually trade the glass plate negatives for some clean glass plates to make the greenhouse. There's mastodon tusks hanging everywhere, and that couple um, are, are seen in front of a float um, with a you know a dummy mastodon, and um, I don't know those, those types of things. Um, and you think of an elephant being representative of memory or elephant never forgetting. There's a beautiful footage of the elephants um, in the collection itself. So uh, uh, things like that kept resurfacing and becoming motifs. You know. That's another one right there. Yeah, my question was kind of along the same lines because I was wondering, um, the story concludes in the Dawson City Find, but I was wondering how you decided where to start telling the story, but also there are so many anecdotes included in the film yeah. that I was wondering how did you decide which ones to include in the film? Because, or did you try to include all of them? <laughs> um, I couldn't include all of them. Uh, I did include a lot of them. Um, there was some that I... Um, you know, I had certain parameters for what got included in the film and what didn't. And uh, the language of it was that if I was going to present a story, there had to be a date that re referenced it or a, a newspaper clip or some uh, hard artifact saying what it was. Um, it had There had to be a picture of the person I was talking about or the building I was talking about. And those two um, things were their own personalities. and and. Um, and then it had to connect with the story in two different spots. Like it could surface once, but it had to surface again, you know. And so um, it was sort of like laying breadcrumbs, you know. So uh, as you go through the first half of the movie, you're saying, where is this going, you know. But then you start picking up the breadcrumbs and those people start coming back, you know. So um, the, the stories that got included were the ones that uh, were moored that way, that, had, um, that could, could work on either end of the, from the first half of the film or the second half of the film. Um, and then there was, you know, it's a lot like putting a jigsaw puzzle together. You know, um, you, you have little pieces and there's holes and then there's necessary holes. There's things you want to get solved, but you don't have the piece yet, you know. Um, but you know that there's a hole there. Like, and one of those would be that I was um, quite sure that the reason why all these silent films were expendable is because the talkies came in. You know, that was the logical conclusion. Um, but I needed to find the newspaper clip that said that. And it was until very late um, that Kathy and Michael, um, who have the entire tome of uh, Dawson Daily News um, bound, uh, were able to come up with that, um, with that clip saying, you know, that the the cinema manager had dumped them in the o into the river or had uh, set them on fire and so that was an extraordinary like sort of last minute linchpin you know uh, same with the I, I already have referenced it but the uh, the glass plates that were found in the cabin um, was a story that was sort of um, apocryphally told I felt um, in two different sources. Um, First in the um, the it was the Yukon 1898 um, that Ethel Anderson Becker 
um, published all the Hague photographs, and she was the little girl who had come um, over the Chilkoot path with Hague and her father, and then grown up to be the woman who published this big tome of, um, you know, it's granted permission by him to try to f bring all those photographs together and, and publish them. And in, her, in the foreword, she tells that story, but she just says, a woman some t at some point found them in her house and uh, asked her boss, you know, didn't say who the boss was or what the job was or when it happened. Um, and also uh, Colin Lowe and his notes in on the National uh, Film Board of Canada's site uh, where City of Gold um, was produced and is distributed by, told the same story also in the same vague terms. And so that was a story I very much wanted to include because it had obvious uh, echoes with the film find, you know, it was the, the lost photographs. And um, I knew for sure that Haig had left all these glass plate negatives with his partner Lars and before going off to Nome to take more pictures of the gold rush up in Nome. And, um, and so I left that as a space in the uh, film until we could somehow fill in those gaps, who it was. And uh, towards the end of the production, and I still hadn't gotten anywhere that I just called up Kathy and I was like, uh, do you know anything about this? And she said, no, but there's an old gal in town and we always kvetch about people getting Dawson history wrong. Uh, let me give her a call. And so she called up Irene, and Irene was like, oh, yeah, that was me. I left my photographs in that cabin. You know? So that was a uh, mystery solved with one phone call. And <laughs> we had the, uh, the, you know, her name and her husband's name and their wedding date and, you know, the when it happened. And here's a picture of the house. It's still there. And, uh, um, you know, the boss and um, everything else. And then I also found that, that picture of them during that parade uh, which was rather miraculous. They didn't even know that photograph existed. So uh, there was lots of things like that. Um, um, the uh, Chief Isaac, the the motion picture of Chief Isaac, Chief Isaac, who's that's like an iconic photograph. The guy in front of the tent, and the entire First Nation uses that as emblematic of of their heritage, um, predating um, the miners and um, and the settlement of Dawson City. Uh, n nobody was aware that there was a uh, motion picture of him alive um, while he was in Moosehide um, in the 1924, um, and that was some tourist footage that uh, ha we uncovered in, um, in Ottawa. Um, and so uh, that got repatriated and um, I guess was uh, incredibly emotional for the First Nation people there to see that. I have another uh, comment to make um, because um, uh, we uh, have spoken about the combination, about your montage, about your way of uh, combining things and um, I think it's pretty interesting that sometimes you um, put together um, a headline, a piece of information with the pictures of the films. And um, I was wondering if you um, have made this up during making the film or if this was an idea you had from the very first beginning. And um, I have to make the comment, I have to admit, because uh, it's, uh, it's, I thought uh, the, um, it's pretty interesting what happened while, while watching the film because sometimes I had the impression that I couldn't trust the pictures anymore because I was reading the headlines and I thought this is the real stuff and then I was seeing the film and oh wow that's fiction and I was like um, very um, yeah it, um, it was weird for me and I couldn't I didn't know what to trust anymore in some places of the film and I just wanted to know if you have thought about that um, m like um, mixing up with the expectation with the reality and the fiction of the films. Yeah, I mean, the premise of the film is that um, all film is sort of a physical manifestation of a memory, you know. Um, whether it's actuality footage, which necessarily also involves some fiction or staging or um, contextualization, or whether it's um, a narrative fiction film, uh, Hollywood or whatever, uh, in those days, New Jersey film, you know. Um, 
which is a uh, a documentation of a day's work um, with actors and directors and um, and all of this stuff sort of uh, becomes of one of a piece um, over time and um, certainly uh, the Dawson collection itself if you think that there's um, actuality fo footage from 1907 and then pretty advanced narratives from 1924 um, with a lot of different montage technique but they're all been thrown into the same pit and they all are earmarked with the same white streaks um, they've been in some ways um, uh, given the same monogram and and have the same weight you know and um, uh, so I felt like it was all fair game for telling the story and that I tipped my hand pretty early because uh, I'm telling a factual story about climbing the Chilkoot Pass and then you see Charlie Chaplin who everyone recognizes, right? So we all know that Charlie Chaplin wasn't there, you know, but th this is a story that inspired Charlie Chaplin to make that. So in some ways it's more real than um, if he was there, right? That um, it, the, the le we're already seeing the legend of it and, and we're speaking to that. Um, in terms of, um, can you give me an example of what you mean with the headline? Maybe boxes falling off the car, um, oh. some fire you see, um, yeah. I don't know, yeah. some some picture of the, the river, um, there's yeah. something floating in it and you just told some story about people throwing something in the river. Right. So, I mean, um, uh, basically, like I said, any image was fair game to to advance my story. Um, there was the added benefit that with, like, some of those footage was actual footage of Dawson City, you know. Um, incredibly, both the Orpheum fire and the D3A fire were shot at the time those buildings were burning down and that we have that record was just another miracle, you know, um, that there was a shot of those 10 films that burst into fire spontaneously in um, 1914, you know, um, in the D3A and that there was a photograph of those is, is somewhat amazing. So um, if anything, those films that are, are images that represent actual, uh, an actual reality or are, are degraded by the idea that anything can be can exist to to illustrate the story um, but at the same time um, I believe our memories are um, comprised of moving <laughs> images and that um, moving moving images become our memories and so um, there's a fluid interchange between those you know and um, I guess you have to trust the, the storyteller you know the 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 headlines were meant to inject this as um, fact. This was historical fact. You know, this is this was how it was reported at the time. Yes, <laughs> just burned, <laughs> please. <laughs> no, uh, I, I have a, a question concerning uh, the importance of, of soundtracks because it's always like. Uh, Michael Gordon for the Kasia, Johan Johansson for the Miners Hymns, and then Alex Somers for uh, Dawson City. H how do you pick your composer, and how does the, let's say, the interaction work? Because when you mentioned the Northerner, as a, or the Northern, yeah. as a kind of equivalent to the Western, of course then Alex Somers with his uh, relation to Sigur Ross is yeah. the perfect uh, oral equivalent to such an idea, and I wonder how that works. So, I mean, Dawson was... Um the relationship with the my relationship with the composer was much different with this film than with the other ones. Um, with Decasia, with um, the Miner's Hymns, uh, these were projects where I was paired with those composers, um, uh, and um, fortunately so, you know, um, luckily. And uh, with uh, Alex, I really chose him. Um, it you know, came out of a conversation that I had had with Sigur Ross, who were fans of Decasia, and uh, we talked about maybe working on a new project, and I had this one kind of fomenting, and, um, uh, th and then it seemed like a good project for Alex and Yonzi to take on, and uh, um, by the time I finally got a rough cut together, Yonzi was off with the band touring, and Alex had that summer to work on it, uh, and he had the idea of bringing his brother, John Summers, in to 
to build the beautiful sound design. Um, and so it was more of a relationship like what is common for a, um, a director and a soundtrack composer to work, where I was, I had a, an, an assembly and an edit of the film um, using his and Yonzi's music as scratch track, mm -hmm. and then he wiped that out and started over again. And, um, but it had already been really informed by the, the, the spirit of that music, that uh, it was going to be ambient and ethereal, there weren't going to be a lot of hard cuts or hard beats, and um, that it, would, it was going to be kind of epic and sprawling and vast. Um, like the North, you know, so uh, um, I, fe I felt like that really informed my edit and my understanding of how the film could work, um, that, it, that you could be lulled into this uh, different world, you know, and I think he really uh, embraced that and was able to come back. I mean, the first cues that he sent me, I rejected, you know, nine out of ten of them, but there was that one I could say, yes, this is the one, let's go here, and then it also made me articulate what I thought the film was about, which is sort of this tragedy of capitalism. And uh, so I said, well, I guess we need more cellos, or, you know, <laughs> we need... <laughs> more cellos than Berkman's and Goldman's. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I have a short uh, comment and a question. Um, what I really loved was how you used in your found footage method to um, use the, the uh, title cards, the intertitle cards, um, to comment on other films. So how you mixed uh, these title cards with, with other footage. And my question would be, um, if I understood it correctly, in your short introduction you said that it's one of your most uh, accessible films. Yeah. Um, how would you, from your perspective, um, contextualize it uh, within your whole oeuvre? So how does this work relate to your other works? Um, well, I mean, I think uh, we mentioned the Miner's Hymns, um, and that was sort of the first film that I made that had sort of a, uh, well, I shouldn't say the first. I, um, this echoes very much the film of her, which came 20 years before it. Um, it's the history of a film collection told using that film collection and other sorting of material. Um, uh, after that, I made Decasia, which is much more abstract and, and in some ways more metaphysical, you know. But I thought that uh, uh, going forward, that um, especially with the Miner's Hymns and the Great Flood, that I could take a specific moment in history, a location or a time or a political movement, and, um, and dive into that. And that could be my way of, um, of, of examining history, you know. Um, uh, vertically, you know, that um, if I had um, the matrix of coal or the UK, um, or if I had uh, the Mississippi River in 1927, that these were axes through which I could explore footage and um, they would form a framework um, to find this beautiful footage that could live together and that you would understand a story without being told it, you know, without there being a lot of text or exposition. Um, and so that was something I tried with those two films. And um, with this one, I thought that there, there was an uh, inherent, uh, this was an incredible history, and there was an inherent metaphysical overtone to it, you know, this idea that um, uh, history could be buried and, um, and sort of uh, frozen there and exhumed and still reflect the society that we live in, you know. And um, uh, that there was room for there to be some sort of, uh, for both to take place, that the abstract um, and the narrative could could um, inform each other. So, um, I don't know, it was my, uh, it was my critique of pure reason, you know. Uh, thanks. Um, I just have a short question concerning the production cost, costs, because uh, I'm not, especially because I'm not really familiar with the copyright and uh, when it comes to uh, such old archive material. Um, maybe you could just explain um, how much did it roughly cost? Did you have to pay anything at all for the archive material? And yeah. 
Well, I mean, it's all archive material, so some of it I did and some of it I didn't. Um, but in addition to, um, you know, the films having these pock marks or um, uh, showing their own materiality, the other thing I'm drawn to are collections that are already in the public domain. Um, so uh, so old that's for free? That's for free, yeah. And so the entire Dawson City collection is free, you know. And um, But there's... The Chaplin footage was not free, and the Lumiere brothers was free, and the Canadian film uh, wasn't free, and then uh, City of Gold wasn't free. Um, but those were all um, collections and archives that I uh, appreciated and um, wanted to support and was happy to the degree my budget could um, afford it to, to pay a price, the, their price, or whatever price we could negotiate. Uh, the one I had trouble with was um, The Trail of 98, the Robert Service film, uh, the film based on the Robert Service uh, novel, and uh, it was released by MGM, and so it's now controlled by Time Warner, so I was uh, up against it with them. Uh, first of all, they didn't respond to any emails for, you know, four or five months, and then when they did, I didn't like what they wrote, you know, so... Um, uh, Eventually, I decided it was uh, I would roll the dice and hire a fair use lawyer, um, some big LA guy who can write a f a, an opinion. Um, and th this isn't a it doesn't mean you're right or that you have the right to it, but it um, is what people use to get an insurance policy, basically for something called errors and omissions. And uh, that means if you get sued, you already have this policy in place. Um, and he looked at the film and he looked at the way I acquired that footage, which was not from Warner. It was uh, it already in the Library of Congress and, um, you know, through a loan I was able to get a copy of it. Um, and so he said, well, there's your loophole. You didn't need to get this, you didn't need to source it there. Uh, so therefore it's fair use. And he said, furthermore, everything in your film is fair use. And so I was like, oh, okay. Because I'm making specific reference to the fact that um, these films are titled and they're credited and um, they're existing as films within my films. I'm not taking a scene. I'm, I'm not just using the avalanche scene to show an avalanche. I'm also saying that this avalanche scene happened in this film. And you understand what I'm saying? I'm making reference to the fact that, it, yeah, it's, that it's a quote. Yeah. Uh, so he said the the way you treat all the material is actually technically a fair use. So at that point, I wish I hadn't paid everyone, but whatever. <laughs> I was curious um, if I caught it properly. You had one scene which you credited with septic tank. Oh, yeah. But it was showing film footage in the ground? Right. Well, it wasn't, actually. Um, what, it, what I looked for there, and, and again, that's, that's tipping my hand, um, is that um, uh, I could have left that title out, of course, and it would just be a bulldozer or a backhoe in this case. Um, and then it cuts to a photograph of, uh, of one of Kathy's photographs that actually exist of the 1978. So what you're seeing is um, an industrial uh, film from 1976 uh, showing how to uh, install a septic tank in a hillside area, you know. And, but it had that, what I was looking for, what I was interested by it was that it had the quality of having been shot in the 70s and the operator uh, looked like he was from the 70s, his hairstyle on his shirt. And um, so... It, it was a, uh, a good substitute for Frank Barrett. And um, I guess this also speaks to, did he leave? Anyway, the question <laughs> of, about veracity uh, is that these titles um, uh, were in some ways footnotes, right? They were saying, uh, this is about a septic tank in 1976. It's not about the film discovery in 1978. Um, it's, it's being used as a placeholder, you know, whereas there's some footage um, that's also advancing the story, but um, it's interesting that it is, it is actual footage from the film find. So in some cases, um, it would say that the 
the title and the date, but it would also say Dawson City Film Find, meaning this is one of these images that was actually buried in the ground and, and recovered. So um, the, um, the crediting, um, it, it spoke to the origins of the, of the footage and how much you should trust it as, um, as, as just illustration of, a, of the story or as a, a bona fide film that was shot um, at the time um, or as uh, a relic from the film find that it's the whole thing's a topic of. And then it could also um, advance the story. You know, it, it, one title would might say The End of the Rainbow, and that was speaking about um, the, the transfer of that ground from native control to mining control or, you know, so that sort of thing. Uh, the poker in Dawson City or um, an inner title that said Buried Alive. and. Uh, the text could um, form part of the story that way. So all, all the microphones are gone. <laughs> so no, no, no. It's a I think Sonia wants to. Are there other questions? Um, maybe just a final question f from my side. Um, Coming back to the soundtrack, um, you uh, decide to uh, exclude uh, the voiceover telling the story and leave the story to be told by uh, text. Uh, for the most part. Yeah, for the most part, till for almost the end. The end. Um, yeah, why do you do that? Uh, yeah, which was the. Um, so, yeah, obviously it was a big decision um, whether this was going to follow the conventional form of a documentary that shows talking heads and has a uh, disembodied narrator uh, explaining to you what happened. Um, I thought that what a big part of the story is that we were swimming in these images and um, that they had to make sense on their own terms. Um, or, or with text, and because they were, it was a story about a silent film collection, that we should read it the way we saw a silent films, and then there's this whole preamble to you get inside the theater and start seeing the images, and then um, well, you see the images, and um, and then when they're rediscovered again, they're wrapped up as, as roles that you can't access anymore. Now they're objects again, and they're their archaeological artifacts. Um, and at that point, um, we're able to talk about them as objects. And uh, so that um, if you spend an hour and a half in this kind of silent morass reading to yourself, um, and there isn't some sort of authoritative narrator telling you what you're looking at, which could be pedantic, um, maybe with the right narrator it, it could have worked. Um, but it, it seemed like that was uh, giving that person a lot of power and how do you choose who that person is and um, what does that say about the story? It seemed like it should be a rumination that was all happening within our own heads. We were reading to ourselves. And then it's that much more jarring to hear uh, the talkie, to see uh, you know the, the mayor of New York um, say talkies or you know, sound pictures or... Um, the, the British Pathé newsreel in Dawson City was a Rick Rollicking town, or, you know, there, or finally Michael Gates' voice, which we haven't heard for oh, going on two hours, saying, I, you know, I um, didn't know what to make of them. I, you know, held them up to the light, and you could see images. And so um, that you are, uh, you realize that you've been in the morass of these images. You've been swimming through them without um, an audio narrator to hold your hand and uh and now you're coming up you're up to the surface again and um what a century we've been through you know so there are no more questions i would uh, first of all thank bill for having been with us tonight and also for making this wonderful movie and I remind to all the students or um, other people who are interested that Bill Morrison will be uh, tomorrow um, 
will hold a master class at the uh, department for film and media studies uh, from two o'clock. Uh, so you are all very welcome to come. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Us.